Literally 86% of money managers can't beat the market. You've probably heard this fact before, right? And it's true. The research shows that actively managed funds can't outperform their respective benchmark index funds. Each of these little pie charts here show how actively managed funds compared to their respective benchmarks, with the orange section representing the percentage of funds that underperformed their benchmark. Ouch. So what does all this mean for you watching? Well, for one thing, it means that for the most part, if you choose to invest your money into an actively managed fund and therefore letting a money manager pick stocks and buy and sell them for you within that fund, well, you'll be worse off than your neighbor who just took the advice of going with the low cost index funds. But what if you not only want to achieve the same results as your index fund neighbor, but you actually want to achieve even greater results. You want to actually beat the market. How possible is that? Is that realistic? After all, I mean, if 86% of the professional money managers can't manage to do it, is it realistic to think that you can? I believe the answer is an overwhelming yes, and I'm gonna tell you why right now. So I'm sorry if this video so far has got you down at all on your prospects of beating the market, but don't worry because by the end of this video, you're gonna be feeling much more optimistic, I promise. And to start adding to some of that optimism, check out this quote by Warren Buffett. If I was running $1 million today or $10 million for that matter, I'd be fully invested. Anyone who says size does not hurt investment performance is selling. The highest rates of return I've ever achieved were in the 1950s. I killed the Dow. You ought to see the numbers, but I was investing peanuts then. It's a huge structural advantage not to have a lot of money. I think I could make you 50% a year on 1 million. No, I know I could. I guarantee that. And this quote actually points to the first of a few reasons why money managers can't beat the market. It's size. When you're working with billions of dollars like the professional money managers are, your options for what you can invest in get more and more limited to only the largest companies. But someone with a smaller amount of money like you or I, don't have these same limitations. So for example, if I think a company which has a market cap of $100 million is an incredible investment, I could literally put all of my money into it if I wanted to. Now the big money managers, on the other hand, no matter how much they love that stock right now, would just simply not be able to invest a significant portion of their total capital into it. And that's because if it's a $100 million company, acquiring $10 million worth of shares would mean acquiring 10% of the company. And to do so, they'd have to slowly acquire those shares over time. Because if they bought them too rapidly, it would actually cause upward pressure on the price. And pretty quickly, as the stock price went up because of their buying pressure, it would become a much less attractive investment. Every share of stock that is purchased is a share of stock that is being sold by somebody else. And with some smaller companies, the daily volume just isn't there for it to be possible for them. And so even if after some time, the money manager with a billion dollars to invest manages to acquire 10% of this great stock, well, they've still only allocated 1% of their total capital because $10 million is 1% of a billion dollars. And so even if that investment turns out to give massive returns, it's not gonna significantly contribute to the fund's overall returns. And what ends up happening is that while you and I are able to concentrate our money into our handful of best investment ideas, the money managers basically have no choice but to put money into their 50th best idea or their 100th best idea or their 1000th best idea. And there's no way you're gonna find a thousand stocks that are gonna double or triple or 10X. It's just not gonna happen. And because they're limited to only the highly traded and the largest companies, there's this entire universe of stocks that they don't even look at or consider because they're just too small for them. Is this making sense? I hope so. It's pretty cool, right? How we actually have an advantage and that we can concentrate into our best ideas and we can consider smaller companies. So that's pretty cool, but we haven't even mentioned the most obvious reason the money managers don't beat the benchmark index. It's the fees they charge. The amount by which the actively managed funds underperform their benchmark index is roughly equivalent to the amount they're charging in fees. If the fund charges a 2% fee, then to beat the market, they have to not only do as good as the market, but they have to do better than the market by 2%, and they have to do that consistently year after year just to be on par with the benchmark index. Now, between this hurdle that they need to surpass just to be on par with the benchmark, in combination with the limitation caused by size that we just talked about, can you see how already by you not having these two handicaps would allow beating the market to become much more attainable? Now, big money managers have another insidious handicap hurting their ability to beat the market, 
which we don't have. As you know, the stock market goes up and sometimes it goes down. And typically as the market goes up, people get more and more excited about stocks because everyone around them is making money and it's during these times that people start throwing their money into the stock market. When you buy into an actively managed fund, the fund manager now has to allocate that money into something. So fund managers end up finding themselves with more and more money to invest the higher and higher the stock market climbs and the more and more overpriced it becomes. But in times when there's panic and the stock market is falling and all the great opportunities are becoming available, the investors in the funds are meanwhile selling and pulling their money out, which means that the money managers are also forced to be selling. Now essentially, these fund managers are kind of working with their hands tied behind their back because during the times that stocks are cheap, they're mostly forced to be net sellers rather than net buyers. Does that make sense? And can you see how that would make it tough for a big money manager to beat the benchmark index fund under these conditions? And are you noticing how all of these conditions aren't conditions that you're subjected to? Funds are the dominant players in the market doing the majority of the buying and selling, and most of these funds are totally focused on the short term. They're focused on what the share price of a company is likely to do over the next six months, rather than on simply buying underpriced stocks and actually treating shares of stock as business ownership. So when you hand your money over to a fund manager to invest your money for you, rather than investing that money for you, it would actually be closer to the truth to say that they're speculating with your money for you. And I know that sounds like something that just can't be true, but the harsh reality is that's exactly what's going on. Let me tell you about someone that doesn't speculate. Manish Pabrai is an investor and he's a very cool dude. In 1990, he started a successful IT company using $70,000 of credit card debt $30,000 from his 401k. And by 1994, he had saved up a million dollars. He wanted to invest that money, so he bought Peter Lynch's book, One Up on Wall Street, as his introduction to stocks. And it was from this book that he learned about Warren Buffett. At that time, Warren Buffett's annual returns averaged over the past 44 years was 31%. Now 31% returns, by the way, means you'd be doubling your money roughly every two and a half years. So Monish, with his goal of turning a million dollars into a billion dollars, decided instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and figure it out for himself, he would simply just copy Warren Buffett, a process he shamelessly calls cloning. And not copying the actual stock picks themselves either, by the way, but rather just the fundamentals and the rules of successful investing that Buffett lays out. So what he did is he read everything Buffett ever wrote and everything ever written about Buffett, watched and attended every shareholder meeting, and he cloned them. In 1999, he started his own fund right before the dot-com bubble crash, and over the next eight years, annualized 29.4% returns. And that's after fees, and that's also while the market only turned out a less than 5% annualized return. Pretty cool, right? In 2008, he met with Warren Buffett, his mentor, for the first time after winning a charity auction for a lunch with Warren Buffett with a bid of $650,000 shared with his friend Guy Spire. And at that lunch, one of the things that Buffett said to them was, if you're even a slightly above average investor who spends less than you earn, over a lifetime, you cannot help but get very wealthy. Is that cool or what? Does that sound nice? Do you think it's possible for you to be a slightly above average investor, spend less than you earn, and copy a proven set of fundamentals? Right now, Manish Pabrai's net worth is $130 million. And since he's 57 years old, he'll almost certainly be a billionaire in his lifetime. Now, I don't necessarily need a billion dollars personally, or even a hundred million dollars. I'd be cool with just a couple million, to be honest with you. With that, I could live entirely off of money that is being made by my money, as opposed to my time being exchanged for the money that I need to live. And to me, that's what I consider the definition of financial freedom to be. And at the end of the day, it's not really the money that we actually care about. It's the freedom. Am I right? And now if investing in the Warren Buffett way is the easiest and fastest way to become a billionaire, then it's naturally also going to be the easiest and fastest way to make a few million bucks. You know, to me, it just makes sense to model after those who have been supremely successful because that way, even if I only achieve a fraction of the results that they achieved, I'll still be very satisfied with what that ends up looking like. So that's my plan. And if you're into it, then go ahead and subscribe and we can do it together. And also share this video with one friend that we would want to join us too. Next, watch this one if you want to keep that learning momentum going. And also remember, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just someone that loves investing and is just passionate about helping people move that finish line of financial freedom up just to be a little bit closer. I'll see you over in this next video.